My name is Oli, I'm a doctor and YouTuber. I'm Taymor, I'm a data scientist and writer. And you're listening to Not Overthinking, the weekly podcast where we think about happiness, creativity and the human condition. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. Today is the first time we have an exciting guest on the show, or rather any sort of guest on the show. Paul, do you want to say hello? Hello. Uh, Paul, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? So I work as a doctor in the UK. I was originally from Singapore, came over to do medical school where I met you in Cambridge, Ali, and then I'm now working as a doctor in London. That's very cool. Um, so today I thought we'd talk about the idea of happiness at work. Because I think this is, a, this is a topic that a lot of people, especially these days, care a lot about. You know, this idea that I should be enjoying my job, I should be having fun doing this career thing. Whereas back in the day, that, that wasn't really it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems like the, the sort of older generation's view of work is that, right, you know, a job is something you have to do, you do your job, and then you have your fun and you get your meaning out of life from everything else. Whereas I guess our generation, we've kind of been sold this vision that you get all this meaning and fulfillment and stuff out of work and out of all this other stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. So, Paul, given that you have started work as a junior doctor around the same time or at exactly the same time as I did, what's been your thoughts about the idea of you know, happiness at work? Like, do you enjoy your job? Would you go so far as to say you have fun when you're at work? Actually, I want to take you one step back and ask the question about whether this whole phenomenon of, as Tim said, I need to enjoy my job comes from the fact that we now have the ability to earn income through what would otherwise be considered our hobbies. And also because the number of jobs have increased such that we have this latitude of being able to choose what we want to do. Whereas maybe in the past, you know, people had to do quite a lot of manual labor kind of things, which is why they didn't have the opportunity to pursue things which they really enjoyed and use that as a way of making an income. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I think the fact that we have a lot more freedom to do pretty much whatever we want is, is a big part of it. I'm not sure to what extent the whole you can make an income with a side hustle thing plays it plays into this because I th I'm I feel like even maybe sort of 10, 20, 30 years ago, people would have had this idea that, oh, I want to be enjoying my job. So I don't think it's really a function of the fact that, hey, anyone can learn how to code in their bedroom and, and make make something happen. Yeah, I think I think the whole side hustle thing is actually like super old. I, th I think this idea of just having one fixed job in an organization, I think that's actually quite a new thing. This is something that's been on my to-do list to look into. But I think the, the current like world of work is, like, is relatively recent. And I think for most of history, everyone's sort of been wheeling and dealing in some way or another. Like, you know, everyone had some, some kind of side hustle that they're doing to try and get yeah, by and try and make some extra cash. So like selling their local grapes in the local market alongside going to their job as a telegram maker or something really yeah, surely it's, not no I, really okay look I, I don't i don't think any of us are super clued up about this um so yeah i, mean, I don't know i i feel like side, side hustles was a very normal thing maybe uh, just over 100 years ago or something and then for the past century it's very much been kind of the era of the organization and that's all like we've ever known and so it seems like, oh man, side hustles is a crazy new thing. You can like make money on the side. This is what everyone's been doing for the whole of history, I think. Uh, okay, well, uh, park, park that one, because I don't think any of us have any actual but, data on this. But actually, <laughs> the, I, I do agree with you about how it's quite a recent phenomenon. I think it's, it's something to do with the Industrial Revolution and mm. how they created the, this whole structure of organizations, you know, back in the day where you have people sitting down doing admin in rows of desks. And also this, this idea about the university system, which generates people for professions to fill a particular role in a particular company, these are all products of the Industrial Revolution. Whereas in the past, people would go to university to study whatever they wanted. Okay, yeah. No, I can go on board with that. The whole kind of the, the, the idea of factories and manufacturing and the, the what was, what's it called? The supply line? No, the production line, assembly line, all of this sort of stuff came about because of the Industrial Revolution. And therefore your role in the workplace as, as a very specialized insect in a massive machine. Is that fair to say? I don't know, man. I feel like we don't really know much about this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. okay that's, anyway, that's it. Paul, let's get back to you. Do you enjoy your job? Yeah. I... <clears throat> yes, Ali, I very much do enjoy my job. <laughs> and the reason why I enjoy my job is because I feel like it challenges me. And I think it challenges me on different levels. So on the one hand, you need... Well, I work as a doctor, so you need to know your, your, your stuff. Otherwise, you won't be able to advise your patients well. So there's an intellectual component to it. And medicine's a lot about problem solving. 
you know, patient comes in with different issues and then you try to sort them out one by one, be they medical or social. So there's intellectual aspect to it. And then there's also this idea of uh, communication and having that personal touch. If you have that, you know, you, you need that kind of personal touch in order to do medicine. And then there's also this very tactile aspect of using your hands. So there's a lot of procedures which you do at medicine, even at a very junior level. You put in cannulas, you, you, you take bloods, and, and all these things provide a very procedural aspect to the job, which also does bring me satisfaction. So it's quite all-encompassing, and, and I do enjoy my job in that way. I'd like to stop you there. This, this all sounds very neat, doesn't it? That's a nice little narrative you've, you've just woven there. There's like these three components to your job, um, and they all really, is that actually what's going on, or is that like you sort of justifying it after the fact? I, I, I'm sure you do enjoy your job, but that sounds like a very cute narrative as to why you do it. Is that really, yeah. Yeah, so this is interesting. To what extent do we self-justify that what we do is useful or, or helpful? Actually, there is a fourth component to it, and maybe this might be my generate new topic of discussion. I was recently reflecting about how medicine is exciting because there's a very tight feedback loop. There's a very tight feedback loop between what you do and the outcomes which patients get. So, and I was talking to a surgeon about this when we were just after a, a laparoscopic appendicectomy last Sunday. So I know that if I deliver a good service, if I have been you know, especially kind to my patients, or if I managed to get them out of hospital earlier, met all their needs, then you can see quite quickly the difference it makes in their lives. And I think that that tight feedback loop gives a lot of satisfaction. And the surgeon actually, I, I would say that there's an even tighter feedback loop, loop for him because if he had done a bad surgery and he, you know, the appendix had fallen apart when he had taken it out or so and so forth, then the patient gets ill and then he's, you know, and that's a mess. Whereas if he had done a very neat surgery, then the patient's immediately fixed from their problem. And I think that tight feedback loop might go some way towards giving satisfaction. What okay, you so, you're, so you're saying that the job is fun because A, it's challenging, B, it requires some kind of intellectual knowledge, C, it gives you some sort of communication-y thing, B, like D, procedural skills, and finally, there's some sort of instant feedback loop whereby you can you know, you know you can see if you've done a good job and this translates to a satisfying a satisfying job yeah but, but would you say for example that you look forward to going to work on a monday morning or is that not really a fair way to think about to think about work because like you know if i want to make a, a youtube video i I'm, I'm for the most part i'm looking forward to sitting down and making that youtube video like i feel excited by the prospect but i wouldn't say i feel excited by the prospect of going to work on a monday morning I don't know if that's if it's fair to judge kind of work in inverted commas in with that particular framework. Tamo, what do you think? Given that you're a, a kind of living the hashtag dream, hashtag living the dream in terms of the startup life. Yeah, I mean, so I think there was I, I had a I had a real job for about a, exactly a year, actually, after I graduated. Uh, I worked in London. And I honestly, I genuinely did look forward to going to work on a Monday morning. But I remember a couple of months in. There was a there was a Friday and I got home and I woke up the next morning and I was actually gutted that it was a Saturday. I was gutted that I wasn't going into work that day. Um, and look, the reason I was skeptical about Paul's nice sort of broken down reasons for why he enjoys his job is because I feel like I feel like I might have done, I, I might have given a similar similar kind of reason as to why I enjoy mine. You know, I, I worked as a data scientist. Uh, you know, for the most part, it was quite, you know, I guess, intellectually challenging work. I was always learning new things. Um, you know, I was using the skills I learned at university in maths and stats. And these all sound like very nice reasons. But I think if I'm being honest with myself, it really just came down to the people for me. The, the, the reason I looked forward to going to work on a Monday morning and the reason I was gutted on a Saturday wasn't because I, I wasn't going to have any intellectual challenge that day. And it wasn't because I wasn't going to do any maths that day. It was because I essentially I wasn't going to see my friends at work that day. Um, so for me, it really, it really all came down to the people. And I think like, yeah, I was quite fortunate in that the job was fun and stuff as well in terms of the work. But I, I honestly think with the, with those same people, we could have been doing anything and we would have had a blast. And that's why I was skeptical of Paul's, you know, oh, you use your manual dexterity and this and that. It really comes down to the people, right, Paul? Like if, if you're all your colleagues, if you didn't like your colleagues, none of this other stuff would matter. You could you could be doing the most intellectually challenging work. You could be doing the most manually dexterous work there is. 
and you you wouldn't be enjoying your job, surely. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I can see that definitely the people because I it's a separate aspect. I I know that if I worked with people who I didn't like, then the job would be significantly less fun. But thankfully, I'm I'm not I've not had that. But I can imagine it being significantly less fun. I'm not sure to what extent this this people. Yeah, I I agree that it's pro- probably a separate issue. Um, because for example, if you if you if you look at people who are you know, solo entrepreneurs and stuff, or even if you look at people who are creators who make, for example, YouTube videos full time or write full time, a lot of people would say that they enjoy their job, even though for the most part it's a solitary activity. Like when I look forward to making a YouTube video, it's not that I'm thinking, oh, I can't wait to hang out with my mates while making this video because that that doesn't happen. I sit in front of my camera and talk to myself for hours on end. But I quite I quite enjoy that aspect of it. So I know, Tame, you said that you, you could have been doing anything. You could have been stacking shelves at Tesco with these same bunch of people and you would have still, have still had a blast. I'm not sure to what extent that's true. Like, would you really look forward to going to Tesco and, and stacking shelves for 12 hours a day, even if you were hanging out with the same bunch of people? I don't think that seems a bit far fetched. I feel like you're being a bit harsh towards stacking shelves. I, I mean, I don't think there's any reason to knock that as a job. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think you, yeah, you, you're right. You kind of need both things, right? Like the, the people thing was great, but then actually, maybe like seven or eight months in, I did kind of reach this point where, yeah, the pe- the people side was still pretty good, but I was getting a bit disillusioned by the work and stuff, and so I was a bit, I was definitely more dissatisfied with the job. A, a, a few okay. uh, maybe like eight months in despite the people thing being good why were you dissatisfied with with the work like what were the factors that led to that i think i think a lot of it actually is the feedback loop kind of thing that paul was talking about um i think uh given the kind of business sort of that i was working in my my role as a data scientist was more of like a medium to long-term thing like i felt like this the stuff i was doing it was like a sort of like a research investment for the company that would pay off, you know, a few years down the line if we keep doing this thing consistently and we make some kind of breakthrough. Um, and so there wasn't really this this great feed, feedback loop. I didn't I didn't really feel like my performance or the thing I was doing would was actually affecting the company's bottom line uh, in any kind of short time frame. And so like I was doing this stuff, but I you know I wasn't really seeing any external results, I guess. And so yeah, I, I think I think Paul's point about the the fast feedback loop definitely resonates. So. I- I'd like to kind of segue into a related topic about feedback loops and specifically artificial feedback loops. So perhaps in your job, because you, the impact of, of what you were doing as a data scientist, as you said, was medium to long term. But what if you had a boss who looked at your work and said, you know, well done, Tim, that was a really good piece of analysis. And in, in such a way generated an artificial feedback loop. I think it still provides that kind of dopamine spike that gives you that gives you the buzz at, oh, you know, I'm, de- I'm good at my job. This is sick. I want to get better. I'm going to be climbing this whatever corporate la- ladder. And so what do you think about that? And, and I suppose the follow-up question to that would be perhaps, you know, for people who are more senior in their jobs, do you think that we ought to be encouraging and praising people more? Because I think that we don't do this enough. Yeah, I think this is like a massive part of why people like medicine. Like, um, we went on uh, a holiday to the Lake District. I, I, I don't think you were there this time, Paul. Um, and we were all talking about kind of the bits of our, our job that make it fun. And almost everyone said something along the lines of that, oh, when a consultant says something nice to me or says, well done, Tom, or whatever, then I just feel really good for the rest of the day. And I think this is, this is like a massive part of it. And like, if I'm seeing patients in a and I'll put a lot of effort into the documentation, into the clocking and making sure I've got a plan that I think is pretty legit. Because then when I present it to a senior and they're like, yeah, I agree. That's really good. I feel like, yes, smashed it. And I think this, yeah, as you said, this, this, this like artificial feedback loop um, is, is, is a big part of what brings job satisfaction. Have you, have you, have you got this in your domain to an extent, Tamil? Uh, if, if I think back to my job, was that much like artificial feedback? Uh, I'm not too sure. I don't think there was too much. I mean, we sort of had like weekly one-on-ones with my manager and stuff. Um, but I don't know. It, it didn't. It definitely didn't feel that hierarchical where, where I was like vying for the attention of my manager, you know, <laughs> the senior data scientist. <laughs> Please notice me, senpai kind of thing. It, it wasn't like that at all. Like, it was just super chill. Well, we'd, we'd basically almost, yeah, essentially talk as equals. We'd have like super candid one-on-ones every week. And so it was never a case of like this buildup of me doing some work and then showing him and like this uncertainty of like whether I'm doing it right. There was just like constant communication and we're like working together. So I like, I don't know. 
Um, Is that why you feel unfulfilled in your job and left? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was no sent by to impress, clearly. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think I don't think that was the reason. Uh, I think that was yeah deeper deeper issues with uh, full time employment. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can see I can see the sort of artificial feedback loop being appealing. Uh, I just don't think I really have that much personal experience of it. Actually, at university, I would have loved that. Actually, I never, I never had, I never had that moment. I, I, I maybe had it once in the four years where my tutor actually said, "You know, good work," kind of thing. But if I, how did that make you feel, mate? It was incredible. It was so good, and it was like so a, what, what, it was like a half a half a sentence email that he sent me. He said, "I'm not sure if this is kosher, but good work on the thesis." Smiley face, <laughs> no capitals. Nice. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Send from my iPhone. That must have absolutely made your week. Yeah, that made, that made my whole four years. But yeah, I, I think like more more stuff like that would have actually been really motivating at university. Um, and I never really feel like I got that from my tutors in general. Okay, so one thing I want to talk about is is, is something that Paul actually said. So uh, several months ago, I think like two months into being being doctors, uh, we were holding a housewarming party at our, at our place in Cambridge. Uh, and Paul very kindly attended, and everyone was like, "Oh man, how's how's work going?" and all that all that stuff. Mm. And Paul's response was that uh, well, I, I can't remember exactly what he said. I think it was something like, "It's it's it's hard work, but it's a lot of fun." Yeah, it's I'm busy, but I'm fun. But yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's bu- busy, but fun. It's busy, but fun. Can you talk a bit about why you why that was your mantra? Well, because not gonna lie. So 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 when I first started out, I was in the busiest department of my hospital. There's a large patient turnover, and so high patient turnover meant that we had lots of jobs to do, and I would um, be constantly on my feet. So it was busy, but it was fun as well because it was a new job. There was a there was a learning curve, and I enjoy learning, so that that was fun. But also, I realized that it, that the hours just flew by, so. The department that I was in had really bad Wi-Fi reception. So there was absolutely no signal. And I wouldn't get any messages, but I wouldn't notice, I wouldn't be on my phone like checking these things because I was so busy. I would get into the hospital and then before I know it, it's lunch. And then before I know it, it's time to go home. And I thought that's absolutely sick. You know, when you go to, when you go to a job and the hours fly by and then you go home and you're like, you've earned another day's wages. That had a certain <laughs> kind of satisfaction to me. You've earned another day's wages. I know. <laughs> is it yeah maybe it's just me being bright eyed and bushy tailed just having started work but yeah, yeah it's just fascinating but I, I think also the other thing is where you choose to put, place your emphasis on so the idea is that everything after the butt I'm sorry everything before the butt you can just discount and like just put a massive strike through um, over it because if I'd said it's fun but busy then what you would have focused on was the busy bit but I actively tried to tell myself every day that, you know, it's busy, but it's fun. And that made me focus on the fun bit of it. Okay, so you're kind of hacking your own brain into uh, into thinking that your work is fun, essentially. Why does, why does it have to be a hack? It can just be genuinely fun, right? It can just be genuinely fun. But I think, uh, you, you like, the, the, the internal feeling you would have had wouldn't really have changed if you said it's fun but busy. But the fact that you said it's busy but fun means that you recognize to some extent that the way that you, like, the story that you tell yourself does play a big part in how you feel about, about your job. I think, it, I think it's true about the story which we tell ourselves. Um, and it, but it doesn't have to be hacking, so to speak, because hacking makes it sound very cynical. But I think that far more commonly, it's more of a gray area. And then we decide the kind of lenses and filters we want to put on it. Just yesterday, we were talking about Seth Godin's blog post about I get to versus um, I have to. So, Ali, can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, so Seth Godin had a blog post a few days ago where is, 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 I think it was, it was all about the difference between the phrase I have to do this and the phrase I get to do this. And when I think of a lot of the boring admin stuff related to, for example, running a business that I don't enjoy, I think of it as oh, I have to write this email, I have to do this. Whereas if I were to hack my brain into and, and rephrase it internally as I get to do this, then it, it would be very different. And I think this is a big thing that a lot of people can learn for their jobs as well. Like, for example, if doing if you're having to do 10 discharge letters for patients on the ward, most people would say that that's not a very fun activity because you have to just go through the notes and you have to write out what happened to the patient. And it is generally considered as tedious admin. 
Whereas if you can think of it as I get to write these discharge letters and you can approach it from a sense of, oh, this is this is a nice thing that I'm doing. I'm helping I'm helping summarize what's happened. I'm helping the GP understand what's gone on. I'm weaving together this narrative and using my medical knowledge to piece together the interesting bits. Just the, that change in internal vocabulary makes you feel differently about about the thing. So I think that is important, but I would I would still call that a hack because you know you're doing this one little thing that is hopefully making making a difference to your life. I don't know if you have any thoughts on the matter, Tamil. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. I think it, it sort of comes down to sort of different time scales of enjoyment and different time scales of like happiness, right? Because there's nothing really out there that is just pure fun and pure like uh, you know gleeful enjoyment at every moment. Um, like e- even outside of the world of work even in, in things that we normally consider fun, like, for example, playing video games or learning a musical instrument or stuff like that. Um, yeah, we, we think of these things as fun, I suppose. But the actual process of, for example, learning a musical instrument, day to day, it's it's not the most fun thing a lot of the time, right? But it's on, on a long time scale, in the grand scheme of things, it is something really rewarding and something really meaningful that's definitely sort of, yeah, on a macro scale, quite fun. The same with like playing video games and stuff. For people who play it really, really seriously, um, you know, serious esports people, I'm sure it's not what they describe as like fun most of the time. And yet on a macro scale, they would say, yes, I enjoy my work. It's very meaningful. I I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. So it's, yeah, I guess it's about not overfitting on like, yeah, the small granular aspects. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, we we're also in quite a privileged position of having jobs that other people like, you know, jobs, which, which other people would envy to some extent. But, you know, to, to go back to this, to what you were saying about happiness, um, I, there is the, I think the Greeks and the philosophers from from, from well, the Greek philosophers drew a, dis- <laughs> we drew a distinguish they distinguish between happiness and eudaimonia have you heard of eudaimonia before? I think so but would you explain it to so us anyway? <laughs> eudaimonia is this concept of a very deep seated kind of happiness you know the, the kind of happiness that you don't put a you can't put a finger on I would say it's kind of like satisfaction a bit more like joy Something very, very deep seated, and it's to do with things like self actualization, you know, being having goals and meeting them, seeing yourself improve and develop as a person over time. It's that kind of longer term happiness, as as I think you are trying to describe. So, like, um, like for example, you know, when you when you wake up on a bright sunny morning like today, and you think to yourself, "Oh, life is good." That okay. is eudaimonia. So, like a sense of deep seated contentment, almost. Yes. Yeah. So we're drawing drawing the distinction here between, for example hedonism which is what you know this gleeful enjoyment of like i'm i am really really happy right now because i'm in the middle of a squash game or, or whatever versus this kind of general sort of like weather versus climate like the weather is what it is now climate is sort of what it's like for these this period of a few weeks to months is that kind of what you mean yeah i think so i think so and i think that maybe it's more worthwhile assessing job satisfaction in terms of climate rather than weather mm. yeah i think there definitely is something to that because i've i've long thought that the 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 metric that you know do i enjoy going to work on a monday i'm i'm not sure that's a reasonable way of of assessing job satisfaction because for example at university like overall the climate of university was absolutely incredible i had a really great time and i wouldn't change it for the world but I did not enjoy going to my 8 a.m. lecture on a Monday morning. So, so therefore, I didn't go to my 8 a.m. lecture on a Monday morning. But had you asked me, you know, do you enjoy going to lectures? I would, would have probably said, uh, not really. I mean, it's kind of fun because I'm hanging out with my friends. But to be honest, I fall asleep in the lecture anyway. But overall, the experience of university was, was really, really fun. And I wonder if we have any other, any other metrics by which we can decide whether we are satisfied in our job and... The reason I ask is because Tamor, for example, like you decided eight months in, which is around the time that Paul and I are into our own our own jobs, you decided eight months in that you were less satisfied with that. So, I mean, what changed? Was it that you no longer look forward to, to, to going to work on a Monday or was it something more? What, what was your mental model for assessing job satisfaction? Uh, I think I think maybe I'm a bit of an edge case in that I'd always really just planned to stay about a year after which I wanted to leave and, and try and do my own thing. Um, and so eight months in, I feel like a lot of the a lot of the novel parts of the job started to sort of plateau. You know, like I'd I'd learned like a ton of stuff in the first few months, and then the sort of rate of learning starts to slow down once you start doing more and more of the same thing. Um, and so a lot of that stuff was no longer that novel for me. Um, the, I, I think the people aspect was always there. In my case, the, the sort of the nature of the work also kind of just became a bit more boring, um, and I kind of started thinking, 
uh, more kind of long term into the future thinking, okay, right, I'm eight months into this. My plan was to leave after a year. Right. What am I going to do now? And I was sort of thinking, thinking towards the future rather than, I guess, being present in my job. And, and I guess that's, that might have been part of the issue. Okay, cool. So having, having left your job, what do you now do and how does it differ, differ to what it was like having a real job? Uh, it's definitely a bit more lonely. So these days I work remotely for a startup in San Francisco. Uh, and so they're on like Pacific time. I'm on like GMT plus one or something. Uh, and so like I basically check in with the team once a day in the evening for me in the morning for them. And I'm, I'm basically working on my own throughout the day. Uh, so that, that kind of sucks, but it's it, 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 like the work is just really interesting. It's very like self-directed. Um, there's no one is anyone's boss per se. It's really like quite yeah, quite a sort of collegiate atmosphere where we're all like figuring stuff out. So that's definitely quite cool about it. Um, I think in terms of like raw gleeful funness, the lack of the people aspect definitely makes it a bit less enjoyable on that time scale, on like a short time scale. But I think long term, this kind of work mm. is a bit more interesting and fulfilling for me. Okay, so you're saying that there is a high level of contentment that you had or that you have with your job today, even though you're sitting in coffee shops working on your own relative to what it was like having a real job yeah exactly yeah. i uh, i think part of the yeah part of i think what, what you're saying is spot on about like the uh do you look forward to going to work on a monday being the wrong kind of metric and i think part uh, once again this is another thing where i think the language we use to talk about something actually really shapes our views of it because like, if, you, if you think about how how we talk about our jobs and things like that we talk about them most often on quite a short time scale things like oh how was your day how was that meeting it's all like really granular stuff it's not it's not that often where we're discussing with people on like a zoomed out level of like you know how do you, how you know how, how do you think you've been spending your time over the past 3 months and like you know let, let's talk about that it's not often that we do that so most of the airtime is focused on these like small granular things which i guess we've kind of all agreed here uh, are not actually sort of that important right yeah, so if you have like a, a a busy day at work particularly or something bad happens or a patient dies that wasn't supposed to, you would then feel bad about those moments and then you'd talk about them with your friends and you'd and then other people would chime in with their experiences and it would be the self-reinforcing feedback loop of this is this is a bad kind of granular experience. Whereas yeah, we almost never say so how's how's your past how, year been? Yeah, how's the past year been? How's the past 6 months been? It's just not it's just not really a question that we ask. Yeah. But there's also the recency effect where you end up focusing on how your day's been, even though you've been asked the question, how's your year been? Yeah, I suppose that's the, that psychological bias to, to uh, disproportionately um, emphasize the things that happened most recently to us. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about job satisfaction and, and job happiness and, and stuff like that. Uh, there was a good podcast of the Gary V audio experience I was listening to in the car yesterday where he was talking about um, positivity and he was saying that when it comes to positivity, a lot of people would think that, oh, if you're being overly positive about stuff, you're just deluding yourself into thinking that you're happy. Kind of like what, kind of like what Mimi, our mom, would say about, oh, you're just telling yourself a story to make yourself feel better. But Gary Vee's thing was that positivity is a strategy. It's not a delusion. And that if you can be positive with everything that you do, that will ultimately have so many far-reaching benefits that you can't even imagine. And there's a, there's a book called The Happiness Advantage, which is very good, which kind of turns the traditional uh, conception of happiness on its head. And, and, and like, instead of saying that you are happy because you're successful at your job, it, go, it actually argues that you are successful at your job because you're happy. And the sorts of people who are happy in general life are the sorts of people, you know, this is strongly correlated with improved performance at work, improved innovation, all of this sort of stuff. So I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on this, whether you've noticed it in your own lives, this idea of being sort of actively positive and how you look at things has changed the way that you live almost. I definitely think so. Even if it's... So on the way to work, some days, I have to tell myself to be happy and to, you know, this whole, I have to do this versus I get to do this. And to come into work with a smile on, on, on my face. It's kind of like, I, re I think back to my days where I was in the army and there was this captain who always came in and he had the cheeriest, hi everyone, kind of thing. And he instantly brightened up the office. And I think that just happy people are just better to be around. You know, you, you don't want somebody coming in with a, with a long face. So I think there's something to that. 
you know, it, it helps you in terms of your relationships and that has a positive feedback loop on how you feel, your, feel about your job. I think there's also something to be said about positive feedback loops where you, en- you tell yourself, oh, you know, I really enjoy this. So like Tammy might say, oh, I really enjoy maths. And then you put more work into it and then you become better at it and then you enjoy it more and so on and so forth. I mean, if you think back to what you'd say your favorite subject was when you were a kid growing up, it probably is the one which you just decided quite arbitrarily that you kind of liked, you know, because maybe the teacher was nice and then you just put more effort into it and then you just got better at it and you felt happy about it. Would you say so? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I think like a lot of the decisions, a lot of the sort of really far reaching decisions we make, like, you know, what you want to study at university and what, what kind of career you want to go into can probably be traced down to like something super arbitrary when you're really young, where like you just have to have like the right teacher for a particular subject he or she happens to like praise you in a particular way. And, and from then on, you start to label yourself as like, oh, I'm good at this subject. And I'm like, maybe not good at the others. And then that subject becomes like part of your identity and becomes your whole thing. And it's all like super arbitrary, I think. Feedback loops created by teachers. There yeah, you go. artificial feedback loops. Yeah. Um, on, on that note, on the latest episode of uh, the Farnham Street podcast, he's interviewing Dan- Daniel Gross. Is one of the, mm. I don't know if you've heard of him, Tamor. Yeah, I, he's, I a, he's an investor in Retool. Oh, he is? Where I work. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. So he's his his he was talking about this this like project that he's doing where he's trying to he he's he's trying to remove the element of luck from from success. And what he was saying on the podcast was that um there are so many people who are successful today because of some arbitrary piece of luck that happened, you know, ages ago. Like for his one of his companies, it, he was pitching it to someone at a coffee shop. It just so happened that an investor was sitting across and overheard the conversation and wanted to invest in this company. All these random coincidences with random people that you meet, kind of like what we're talking about, a random teacher. There's, you know, that right combination of that, you know, y- you like that teacher. Maybe they're quite pretty and maybe they're praising you for being good at maths. And you're like, you know what? And now I'm good at maths. And then that becomes a self-reinforcing feedback loop. All this stuff is all very, very luck based, and his whole thing is that for, I, don't, I don't know how he's doing it, but he's he's trying to uh, make make this more more a systematic thing rather than a thing that's that's reliant on on serendipity. I don't I don't really know where, where I was going with that. I was just uh, signaling that I listened to other podcasts apart from my own. Yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, I think I um, think the project he's working on is really interesting. It's essentially like a, a tournament where anyone from the world, if they're interested in something or working on any kind of project, you know, however old you are, you might be like trying to cure cancer when you're 16 or something, or you might just be working on like, some tech thing, whatever. Um, you can essentially like take part in this tournament and every month, like the top N number and N people get like selected and they get to get a bunch of money and they get flown out to San Francisco to meet other people and that kind of thing. So it's, it kind of removes the, the sort of, it, it kind of widens the opportunity for sort of self-driven people to uh, yeah, access capital and, and uh, networks. So I think it's a bit, cool. it's a bit different to what we talked about. Okay. Fair news. Um, so shall we uh, start to wrap up? I think that The Magic of Thinking Big is a good book. Oh, tell us about this. I haven't actually read it in absolutely ages, The Magic of Thinking Big, but it's, it's, it's so often recommended on everyone's reading list. So it's a great book because it teaches you, well, it, it doesn't teach you, but it gives you an you know, alternative way to think. And so, I mean, we come back to, to what we were talking about, how cynics could say, oh, is this just all a story you can tell yourself? Yeah, to a certain extent, it is a story which you can tell yourself. But as I was saying earlier, it's more great than that. And if you choose to have a positive frame of mind, then you get into this self-reinforcing positive feedback loop where you're positive about what you're doing and then you put more effort in and you get better at it. So Magic of Thinking Big tells you that you should start by thinking big and and telling yourself that you are that you can master something or you are good at, some, at doing something and then take things from there. So it's getting yourself into that positive feedback cycle. Um, it's an absolutely... It's quite an old book, isn't it? I, I think it was really written old, in the yeah. 1950s or something 40s, like something like that. Yeah. But, but very good advice. And, and, and still it, super apl- applicable today. Yeah. Um, so like on, 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 on a similar note of kind of choosing, choosing to be positive about things, this is something that, this is advice I often give to medical students because I feel like a lot of medical students, including people that, that, that we know, have this, have this attitude of, oh, I just need to get through medical school and then once I'm a doctor, then I'll be happy. And I find that that I I'm very, I get very uncomfortable when people say that because having been through med school and now and now as doctors I I don't, I, I think most of our friends including probably including us we'd probably say that we enjoyed med school 
med school is more objectively fun than being a doctor partly because now it's no longer an, an option to go to work you physically have to get up in the morning and go to work each day um and so when, when people have this attitude of oh you know i hate med school what is my life i, I can't wait till i'm spat out the other end and, and, and then i'll be happy i think it's almost similar to when people are like oh i just need to work another 20 years at my deadbeat desk job and then then i'll be able to retire and then i'll be happy so this is something that i i try and, and counsel people against but i don't know I, i i suppose it is easier said than done to choose to be positive about things what do you reckon I, th i think that's a big cultural aspect i mean i think in the uk it's almost like yeah there, there's definitely like a, a sort of complaining culture in the uk like positivity is not like cool you know it, if anything if anything is cool it's negativity out of the two of them right um and i'm sure that's very specific to the uk i mean what, what were your experiences in singapore paul like do people is there is there this culture about complaining about your job and that kind of thing or are people generally just much more positive and vocally positive uh Not more than the UK, I'd say. Oh, okay. Definitely not more than the UK. I think possibly worldwide, it's just not cool to be positive. <laughs> But it should be a cool thing, shouldn't it? It would be, it would be make the job better yeah. when everyone's positive about it. One of my colleagues recently said that, oh, my previous rotation was so good. I learned loads. I laughed loads. And I thought, oh, that's, that's really nice. <laughs> that's what you want in a job, right? You learn loads and you laugh loads. Okay. And I think that's a pretty reasonable note to end this on. So we're saying that our uh, recommendations for how to enjoy your job is to learn loads, to laugh loads, to cultivate a deliberately positive attitude. Um, and that'll feed back on itself and, and make you enjoy your job more than you actually do. Nice. Shall we end on a, a final segment of funny thing of the week or insight of the week? Funny thing of the week or insight of the week. Okay, Tamar, you can start. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm actually in Singapore right now, which is, uh, which is, I think, super interesting. I had lunch yesterday with... Uh, actually a podcast listener which was very nice uh and yeah one of the things that we were talking about was like sort of the cultural differences between singapore and the uk she she actually studies in london but lives in singapore most of the time um and yeah she was saying that in in the uk people are just a lot more uptight in general um like for example she found it weird that you you can't really look at people on the tube you're just meant to kind of look at the floor or like it would be weird if you go up to someone in the coffee shop and ask if you can sort of sit at their table and that kind of thing and apparently in singapore um it's much more of, of a norm to like look at people on the streets and smile at them and that kind of thing and sit down next to them in coffee shops uh so yeah i, th I thought that was really interesting because like yeah i think we've spoken about uptight british culture in the past i think it was like episode two about putting yourself out there um and it, it's nice that it's not like that everywhere you know so i, I thought that was a, a nice bit of insight that i'd like to sort of take back to the uk just just be less uptight and be more kind of yeah warm and friendly with strangers have you got any insights paul because i really don't <laughs> well i've got so we so I, was, i was talking to you about so something which i've enjoyed or found funny this week was spoilers without context are you familiar with spoilers without context spoilers without context so have you have you have you heard about that before spoilers without context uh no, no. I, I guess not. Anyway, so Spoilers Without Context is there are memes on the internet um, where they post random pictures, which if you hadn't watched said show, which they're parodying, you wouldn't understand these spoilers. So Game of Thrones recently released their first episode. And so there were all these spoilers, which kind of referenced what went on in Game of Thrones. I'm not going to give anything away here, but they were really funny just looking at these pictures and then mentally going, ah, I can see what you're doing there. And knowing that other people who had not watched the show or not watched the episode would have absolutely no clue what's going on. Yeah, so like almost re referencing um, imagery in the show that only if you've seen that specific episode would you know what it's talking about, but doing it in a completely random way. So like, for example, in the latest episode of, of Game of Thrones, spoiler alert, there's a scene where you've got a kid who has been kind of nailed to a wall and he's got like this spiral pattern of bones surrounding him. And that is a very distinctive image from that episode that every single person who's seen that episode will, will recognize. And then this meme of spoilers without context was a prawn dip where the shrimps are arranged in a spiral pattern around oh. with hashtag spoilers without context. And when you see that, you think, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Whereas if you haven't seen that, you would, you would just be like, what the hell's going on? That uh, I think really it, 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 feeds, it feeds really nicely into this memes as an inside joke that's appreciated by millions of people yeah that's really yeah so i found yeah i found that really fun uh i have an idea for so for, for one one final thing given that we have a guest on the, on, the, on the show for the very first time uh can you share a piece uh a snippet of life advice or a quote that you live by or you know some advice that that your dad gave you that stayed with you 
for a long time. It, it can be anything. Uh, I know that you're a, um, a Bible bashing Christian, so it, it might be something <laughs> from the gospel. Mm. It's more it's more of an insight than than I would say necessarily a verse or what somebody said to me or you know it's not something which I've it, it's of as Ali said I'm a Christian and reading the Bible I think it's because in Christianity and because I think that I'm going to go to heaven so the idea of having your future sorted and so allowing you to do anything which you want whilst you're whilst I'm here you know with the, and. I would say that maybe that has some relation to what we were talking about, job satisfaction. If something which, you know, is sticking along, like, for example, medicine, and you know that you are from F1, you're going to F2, and then that frees you up to do anything which you want with your, with your other time. It's kind of like, you know, your des- you know that it's a good destination which you're going to, and you feel really... So I think... So that's something which I've been reflecting about in my own faith, and I, you know, quite a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's very, that's very nice. Thank you for sharing, Paul. That's so, right. We're going to wrap up this episode. Thank you so much. We've been talking about job satisfaction. And uh, yeah, I guess our, our advice is to laugh lots and, and learn lots and cultivate uh, deliberately. So yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, please do leave us a, a review. And we'll see you in the next episode.